this. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the hyperbolic metric for concreteness on the upper half plane. But as we've seen, there's I wrote down the hyperbolic metric also on the unit disk, and we will soon see that there are that almost any region in the plane carries a natural hyperbolic metric. And this metric is determined by its conformal geometry. So we have this conformal flexibility, and yet somehow it gives rise to a certain kind of rigidity. Okay, so let's talk about the conformal metric on the upper half plane for a moment. So I'll remind you that this is given on H, which is the set of Z with the positive imaginary part, by the metric rho, which is Z over the imaginary part of Z. Frequently, I think of Z as being X plus IY, and so I'll often write x in place of the real part of z and y in place of the imaginary part of z. So this is the metric dz over y. So let's say, let me just briefly remind you, many, most people know some hyperbolic geometry, but even if you do, let me just jog your memory and remind you about um, a couple of facts here. So um, the first thing uh, I want to emphasize is that the automorphism group of the upper half plane is in fact equal to the group of isometries of the upper half plane with respect to this metric, as long as we require that the isometries preserve orientation. So here we have the isometries are just defined to be the group of analytic maps from H to itself, which are one to one and onto, and analytic, and automatically they preserve this metric. It's quite remarkable. On the other hand, it's not too hard to check. So how would you check that the, uh, the automorphism group preserves uh, uh, this metric? Well, first we have to know what the automorphism group is. And we and I've written it down before. It's the group of two by two real matrices of determinant one acting by Mobius transformations. But simpler, you can say this group is generated by the maps of the form z goes to ac plus b and the map z goes to minus one over z, where uh, a has to be positive and a and b are both real. So in fact, this is the subgroup that fixes the point at infinity. Now, how do we check to see if a metric is invariant under one of these maps? Well, first let's check intuitively. If you were to take the map z goes to 2z, that certainly is an automorphism of the upper half plane. And what it does is it takes some object at a certain distance from the origin, and it, it moves it twice as far away. So it makes every feature of the object twice as big as it used to be in the Euclidean metric, dz. But remember, we're dividing by y here. This is just y. And y is nothing more than the distance of your object from the real axis. So when you multiply by 2, that distance also goes up by 2. And the hyperbolic metric is the Euclidean metric scaled by the distance to the real axis. So in the hyperbolic metric, this object is isometric to this object. And if we were to divide by two, you'd get another copy of the same object. All three of these are isometric to one another. So one, one needs to acquire a sort of intuition for the hyperbolic metric. The real axis is infinitely far away. It should be thought of as a horizon. And, um, and uh, when objects get close to the horizon, they get smaller visually, even though metrically, in this metric, they remain the same size. Let's also do a little exercise. What's the distance from i to say i times y? Or let me call it 
I times B. Well, we need to integrate this metric from here to here. So we would integrate the Euclidean metric divided by Y. So Y is increasing from one to B. And so this distance here is equal to the integral from one to B of dy over y. And that's nothing more than the logarithm of b. So this is an important fact to know. The distance between two points on the imaginary axis is given by the logarithm of the ratio between their y coordinates. If this was b2 and b1, we just get the log. This would go from b1 to b2, and we get the log of b2 over b1. In particular, as B1 goes towards the origin, the ratio B2 over B1 goes to infinity, and the distance becomes infinite. So in fact, the, uh, the hyperbolic metric on the upper half plane is complete. So I should add that here. Rho is a complete metric. Cauchy sequences converge. It takes you have to travel an infinite distance to reach the real axis. Another way to think about this, slightly more intuitively, is that because z goes to 2z is an isometry, this point 2i and i, their distance is log 2, but so is the distance between i and i over 2. So is the distance between i over 2 and i over 4, and so on. This geometric series is a sequence of segments. Should probably put this one up higher. The realism, 2i. These segments all have equal length. And so clearly you have to travel an infinite distance to reach the origin. I should also say that it can be easily verified that the imaginary axis is a geodesic in this method. It's a straight line. It's the shortest distance between any two points on it. And in general, the geodesics for the hyperbolic metric consist of either lines perpendicular to the boundary or uh, circular arcs with both endpoints uh, perpendicular to the real axis. These are the straight lines in this, in this metric space, even though they don't look straight. And there's a lot to say about hyperbolic geometry that I'm not going to go into in detail. I want to just give you a feel for it at uh, this point. Um, but let's check that the hyperbolic metric really is invariant under the whole automorphism group of the upper half plane. So to do that, we have to know how to pull back a metric under a uh, conformal map. And so let me write the general formula. If rho is rho of z dz, then g upper star of rho is rho of g of z times the absolute value of g prime of z times the absolute value of dz. So this is a new function, a new positive function being multiplied by the, uh, the basic Euclidean metric. That's what you get if you transport rho to the domain of g by a change of coordinates. Now, in the, we'll often be interested in pulling back this metric, which for definiteness, I'll put a subscript h on, a hyperbolic metric on the upper half plane. g star of the hyperbolic metric on the upper half plane is therefore just the absolute value of g prime of z over dz divided by the imaginary part of g of z. The imaginary part is positive because g is mapping whatever region is defined on into the upper half plane. And we'll frequently need to, com to, to, to compute like this. So let me write down that formula once and for all. OK, now let's check that under this transformation, the pullback of the hyperbolic metric is what it is what it should be. So suppose G is AZ plus B. So for AZ plus B, we have that G prime of Z is A, which is a positive real number. That's one thing we need to compute. 
And what about the imaginary part of G of C? So in other words, the imaginary part of AZ plus B. Well, B is real, so its imaginary part is zero, and A is real, so it just scales the imaginary part of Z. So this is A times the imaginary part of Z. And so when we pull back the hyperbolic metric by this transformation, we get G upper star, row H is, and then on the top, we get an A, B, Z, and on the bottom, we get an A imaginary part of Z. And the A's cancel out, and we see the metric is preserved. Okay, so that's a simple example of checking invariance. That's the formula that underlies the picture I was drawing here. As points are pushed away from the origin or pushed away from the real axis, they get bigger in the Euclidean metric, but this factor of Y compensates, so the net effect is isometric. Now, more interesting is if we view G of Z as minus one over Z, then G double G prime is not constant, it's uh, one over Z squared. And uh, now it's a good little exercise. How do you compute the imaginary part of minus one over Z? Well, whenever you have a fraction and the bottom is complex, you can make it the bottom real by multiplying by the complex conjugate on a, above and below. So we multiply above and below by z and z bar, and we get minus z bar over uh, the absolute value of z squared. And this being real, that comes out, then we have the imaginary part of minus z bar. Now, if z is x plus i y, then z bar is minus is x minus i y. So its imaginary part is negated. But then there's another minus sign here. So we get back the imaginary part of Z. So this is all equal to the imaginary part of Z times one over the absolute value of Z squared. Okay, so finally, what do we get when we pull back the metric? G star row of H. On the top, we have the absolute value of G prime, but that's the absolute value of one over Z squared. We have DZ, and then on the bottom, we have the imaginary part of Z times one over the absolute value of z squared. And these two factors cancel, and we're left with the hyperbolic metric again. Okay. So we have, in fact, invariance of this metric under the automorphism group of the upper half plane. Now, it's also a beautiful fact about the upper half plane that the automorphism group acts transitively. You can move any point to any other point. In fact, just using these transformations, you can move any point at any other point. So let me remark that odd H acts transitively on H. And um, one way to see that is if you let if you look at G of Z is AZ plus B, then if you apply this to our favorite point in the upper half plane, namely the point I, this goes to AI plus B. And A and B can be any two real numbers provided A is positive. And that just characterizes the points in the upper half plane. So every point is the image of I under an automorphism, in fact, under an affine automorphism of the upper half plane. Now, because of this, not only is this metric invariant, but it's the unique invariant metric up to scale. So rho is the unique bot invariant metric up to scale. And, um, and so to normalize it so the scale factor goes away, it's, you, it's made completely unique by requiring that its curvature, which we'll discuss in more detail to come, is equal to minus one. That's why it's called the hyperbolic metric because it's negatively curved. The upshot is, is that rho h is a conformal 
invariant of H. What that means is that if you give me H as an abstract Riemann surface, you just give me its conformal structure, I can find this metric canonically. It's functorially attached to the, uh, the, the region H. And the reason we know it's functorial is that it's invariant under the full automorphism group. It's uniquely characterized just by saying that it's invariant, as long as we somehow normalize uh, the scalar factor by saying the curvature should be minus one. So what's happened is we've taken these rather flexible conformal maps and on a particular region like the upper half lane, we find there is a natural underlying metric. That's again, this passage from somehow from flexibility to rigidity. Now, just a word about the unit disk. The unit disk is isomorphic to the upper half plane. So exactly the same story works there. That is the automorphism group of the unit disk is isomorphic to the automorphism group of the upper half plane. Once we've chosen an isomorphism between these two Riemann surfaces, and this isomorphism, once it's chosen, sends the hyperbolic metric on the disk to the hyperbolic metric on the upper half plane. Uh, so I won't write down the transformation, but I'll remind you the hyperbolic metric on the unit disk uh, turns out to be of this form. Just as the hyperbolic metric on the upper half plane blows up at the real axis because of the one over y, this metric blows up at the boundary of the circle because near the circle, the absolute value of z is tending to one. And that blowing up is what renders the metric complete. And of course, it's invariant under this automorphism group. And of course, the automorphism group of the, of the disk acts transitively as well. X transitively. But here, there's a, there's a somewhat more standard formula for what that transitive action should be. So what's an example of a Mobius transformation that sends the disk to itself and sends zero to the point A, for example, that's off center? We're a little bit less familiar, I think, with these transformations. There are no linear maps of the disk to itself other than rotations. So how do you move a point off center? This is accomplished by the following transformation. So G A of Z is, sorry, I'm going to do it backwards. How do I move a point A to the origin? <laughs> it's Z minus A over one minus A bar Z. This is an element of the automorphism group of the unit disk, and it has the property that G A of A is equal to zero. Now, how do I know it maps the disk to itself? Well, a good check would be that it sends the unit circle to itself. Notice this is a Mobius transformation defined on the whole Riemann sphere. So what's key is that its restriction to the disk goes into the disk. I know if I can show it sends the circle to itself, then it will automatically send the disk to itself because A is in the disk. So let me emphasize here that A is itself in the unit disk. Um, so how do we show that when the absolute value of Z is equal to one, that the absolute value of GA of Z is equal to one? Well, here's a nice trick. If the absolute value of Z is one, then the absolute value of Z squared is one, which is the same as ZZ bar. And in this formula, there's a one already. So what we do is we write g of z for the absolute value z is equal to one. We can rewrite this as z minus a over z z bar minus a bar z. I just replaced one with z z bar. But now there's a z in both terms, so I can factor that out. And if I'm interested in taking absolute values, well, the absolute value of Z is one. So when I factor that out, I just get a number of modulus one. So this goes away. And then the top and the bottom are complex conjugates of one another. 
Well, the complex conjugation is an isometry. It doesn't change the length of a, of, of a complex number. So this absolute value is the same as that one. So indeed, this is equal to one. Okay, so that's one example of a map that moves zero uh, A to the origin. Are there other examples? Well, if I had a, another map with the same property, it would differ from this one by a map that sends the disk to itself and fixes the origin. And those are only rotations. So in fact, the full automorphism group of the disk can be written as the set of transformations of the form E to the I theta, Z minus A over one minus A bar C. Subject to the relation that A is in the real numbers and uh, theta, uh, sorry, A is in the disk and theta is in the real numbers. Of course, modulo two pi if you like. Okay, so that's a slightly different form for, uh, uh, and a convenient one for thinking about automorphisms of the unit disk. Now the unit disk is maybe, it's better adapted for certain considerations than the upper half plane because of the fact that the unit circle is there, that we have the symmetry of the circle. And we exploited that when we discussed the Schwartz lemma. So let's now return to the Schwartz lemma and do it, say, leisurely and properly. So the Schwartz lemma has two forms. I'll say the form we proved last time rather briefly. So the first version is let f be a map from the disk to itself, which fixes the origin. So in other words, the special thing about this map is it's bounded by one throughout the disk. Then various things happen, but in particular, the absolute value of the derivative at the origin is always less than or equal to one. And equality holds only if you have a rotation. In other words, only if you have an automorphism of the disk. And now comes the more, much more geometric and much more flexible and somehow natural and modern version of this metric, of this, of this statement, which is implied by this one. So this is sometimes called the Schwartz pick theorem, but it says, let F forget about base points. Suppose you have an analytic map of the disk to itself. Then either F is an isometry for the hyperbolic metric on the disk. And in particular, F is in the automorphism group of the disk. Or the norm of F prime as measured in this metric is strictly less than one, say at P. Sorry, the P looks a little bit like a row. Let's see this, the norm of F prime in this metric is strictly less than one throughout the disk. Now, I'm not saying it's less than a constant less than one. In fact, these mappings that are contracting are, are often not uniformly contracting. What this means is that at every given point in the disk, if you take a vector and apply the derivative of this map to it, you get a new vector. And that vector is shorter in the hyperbolic metric than it started out to be. That implies, by applying the, that idea to geodesics, that points are moved closer to one another when you apply uh, this mapping F, as long as we include the case where F is an isometry, in which case distances are, uh, are preserved. Okay, now I claim that this part, let me call these A and B, I claim that part A and B are really the same theorem. Uh, in light of everything that I've said so far. And the reason for this is the following. 
Uh, so let me, we proved A last time. I'll remind you the proof is basically you consider the map f of z over z. And you analyze this map to prove the desired result, its value of the origin being f prime. Um, as for B, well, suppose we want to show the norm of the derivative is less than one at some point. So suppose proof of B, suppose uh, P is in the desk and F of P is Q. Now, when we're studying the norm of the derivative, if we compose by an isometry in the domain or in the range, that preserves length, so it doesn't change the norm of the derivative. So we can normalize so p equals q equals zero. What that means, this is a very common procedure, let me say once and for all what this kind of thing means. It means that since the, the whole problem is symmetric, we can change by isometries, change by symmetries of rho to get an equivalent function to study. So we replace f with g1 composed with f composed with g2 for suitably chosen automorphisms of the disk. And in fact, since the automorphism group acts transitively, we can choose G2 to move P to the origin, and then we can choose G1 to move Q to the origin. And then instead of studying F prime at P, we're reduced to studying this new F, which I'll continue to call F, where P is now moved to zero, and moreover, Q is moved to zero. So F sends zero to zero. But if F sends zero to zero, its norm on the tangent space at zero is just its ordinary derivative. And its ordinary derivative is strictly less than one unless the map is a rotation. And so that establishes the theorem. So then apply A. Okay. So this is, this is a, a, a common proof principle in complex analysis. I call it special case equals general case. <laughs> if you have enough symmetries, you can take a general case and reduce it to some very particular case, like part A, and then part A you prove by some other means. For example, we use the maximum principle to prove part A. Okay, now why is the Schwartz lemma so ubiquitous and so important? You don't see maps from the disk to itself for all of your life tend to see entire functions or functions between strange domains like squares and rectangles. What does the Schwartz lemma have to do with any of this? Well, let me make a definition. So let U contained in C be a region that is conformally isomorphic to the unit disk. This means that there exists a one to one onto analytic function F from U to the unit disk. Then the hyperbolic or Poincaré metric on U is defined by row U is equal to the pullback under F of row of the disk. So this definition provides now almost any region in the plane or a very abundant set of regions with canonical metrics as well. That spreads this idea of a conformal invariant 
to a much broader landscape. So all we need for region U to have a hyperbolic metric is that it's isomorphic to the unit disk by a conformal map. And conformal maps are flexible. And that flexibility means lots of U's admit conformal maps to the disk. In fact, we'll prove the Riemann mapping theorem very shortly, which says that anything that could be isomorphic to the unit disk is. On the other hand, that means every such domain carries a canonical metric. Now, you might say, wait a second, this definition is, is ambiguous. The reason is, what if I had a second conformal map to the unit disk, another mapping G? Then I could pull back the metric on the disk under G instead of under F. Maybe I would get a different result. But that's not going to happen. And the reason is, if you have two maps to the unit disk, then by going over and back, you get a map of the unit disk to itself. You get an element G in the automorphism group of the disk. And the automorphism group preserves the metric. So if you take F and you post compose with any automorphism of the disk, you still get the same metric row of U because that automorphism was an isometry. So therefore, this metric, when it does exist, is completely well defined. And now we can extend the Schwartz lemma to, to the following kind of statement. We then have a theorem, any analytic map F from U to B is either an isometry or a contraction. from the hyperbolic metric on U to the hyperbolic metric on D. So now we have, at least for these simply connected domains, isomorphic to the disk, a much more powerful uh, version of the Schwartz lemma. It's just we have to be able to figure out what these metrics are on the domain and range of the map. And the reason this is true, of course, is that you have this map from U to V, but U is isomorphic to the unit disk, and so is V. And so any question about a map from U to V can be turned into a question about a map from the disk to itself, and the ordinary Schwartz lemma applies to that, to that map. Okay, so that's pretty good for regions in the plane that look like topological disks. But what about other plane regions in the plane? What if you have if your U happens to look like this, it's a region with three holes. In the plane. This is not analytically isomorphic to the unit disk because it's not even homeomorphic to the unit disk. Well, it might happen, nevertheless, that the universal cover of this region is isomorphic to the unit disk. So let me remind you that if you have a region in the plane, and you pick a point in it, then there's a naturally attached space called the universal cover, which is constructed topologically, and a covering map sending this space down to this space such that the fundamental group of u tilde and v tilde is trivial. This is a simply connected space. And this map has a deck group, the group of automorphisms of U tilde that respect projection to pi. And that's isomorphic to the fundamental group of U relative to this base point P. What would be the fundamental group in the case I've drawn as an abstract group? Little topology question. What's the fundamental group of a, of a disk with two holes? Free group on two generators? Yeah, that's right. So this, this group is actually quite large. It's the free group on two generators. And it might be kind of hard to visualize what this space U tilde is and exactly what this covering map is and so on. But what I want you to notice is that U tilde 
has a complex structure on it. Technically, it's a Riemann surface because pi is a local homeomorphism. So if you have a point up here, it has a local chart in the complex plane by just composing with pi on a small neighborhood. And so this object is a Riemann surface in its own right. That is, it's a complex manifold. And we could ask, well, maybe this manifold, which is simply connected now, has a chance of being isomorphic to the unit disk. Maybe it is. So we say U is hyperbolic if its universal cover is isomorphic to the unit disk. Now let's think what would happen if the universal cover were isomorphic to the unit disk. Then instead of covering this this guy by u tilde, we could cover it by the unit disk. We'd have some new covering map, let me call it C. And we'd have a group of deck transformations acting here. <clears throat> but th this group preserves the complex structure of the universal cover. And so th the group of deck transformations here would also preserve the, um, the complex structure. In other words, we ha would have a group gamma contained in the automorphisms of the disk <clears throat> such that CGC is CC, all G in this group gamma. And then we'd have a covering map that goes down to U. Well, gamma leaves the hyperbolic metric rho delta invariant. And that means if we want to measure the length of a vector here and we take its pre-image up on the unit disk, well, there's many places we could measure it because there might be many pre-images of our point, but they all differ by elements in the deck group and the deck group act preserves distances. It acts isometrically because it's contained in the automorphism group. And therefore, the hyperbolic metric on the unit disk by virtue of gamma invariance, descends to give a hyperbolic metric on rho u. So we then define, we then, uh, we let rho u be the unique metric on u such that when we pull it back to the unit disk, we get the standard metric on the unit disk. So now we have an even broader set of regions in the plane and more generally Riemann surfaces, which carry canonical hyperbolic metrics. Namely, any Riemann surface that's covered by the unit disk carries such a natural metric. Now, some of you already know and maybe have seen the proof that any simply connected Riemann surface is isomorphic to the Riemann sphere, the complex plane, or the unit disk. So in fact, this statement that the universal cover here is the unit disk happens very frequently. And therefore, it's almost always true that a Riemann surface or a region in the plane carries a hyperbolic metric. We're not going to assume that theorem in this course. To the contrary, we're going to prove it in special cases. So what I want to do now is first formulate a statement like the Schwartz lemma that applies even when the regions are not disks, and then go through many examples of regions that have explicit isomorphisms to the unit disk or the upper half plane. And then we can compute the hyperbolic metric on this abundant collection of uh, example regions. OK. so. We now have a definition of the hyperbolic metric on a um, Riemann surface or domain in the plane that might not be a disk, might not be simply connected. And the corresponding generalization of the Schwartz lab reads as follows. Let f from u to v be an analytic map. between hyperbolic, and now I'm going to call them regions, or more generally, Riemann surfaces, if they're more abstract than a, than a plane region, um, 
then two things might happen. Either one, well, in the simply connected case, F was an isometry. In the multiply connected case, what we find is that either F is a covering map and a local isometry. Or F is a contraction. And of course, this is from the hyperbolic metric on U to the hyperbolic metric on B. And we'll see some examples where, uh, where we have covering maps and local isometries in just a second. Okay, so this is. This is the general statement of the Schwartz lemma. And of course, one of our goals will be to show that there are many, many regions that have hyperbolic metrics so that this becomes a, uh, a useful uh, concept. Um, okay. So let's do some examples. So what I want to find to start out with is examples of regions in the plane that are isomorphic to the unit disk. So examples of U isomorphic to the unit disk or to the upper half plane. Both of these are hyperbolic Riemann surfaces, but unit disk is isomorphic to the upper half plane. So once you found an isomorphism to the upper half plane, if you prefer the unit disk, you just compose. So the first class of examples is we can apply Mobius transformations. So what we're really looking for is a map from U to the disk or from U to the upper half plane, or going the other way, from the disk to U, et cetera, all of these being isomorphisms. So let's suppose F is, an, a, is a Mobius transformation. What can you do? Well, of course, if you have any circle in the plane, here's the unit disk. If you have any other circle, C, there is a map of the form AZ plus B that sends this circle to this circle. So this region U bounded by C is a hyperbolic Riemann surface. It has a hyperbolic metric. So for example, on the, the disk of radius R defined by the absolute value of Z is less than R, we have a hyperbolic metric, which you can compute using this kind of mapping. It's rho of the disk of radius R is equal to, well, first, what's going to go on the bottom? It's going to be um, R squared minus the absolute value of Z squared. Instead of one, which we have on the unit disk, you have R squared so that this quantity in the denominator blows up at the boundary. But then there's an additional factor coming from F prime, which is an R uh, on the top here. So that's by an easy computation. If we take u to be the disk of radius r, then we can take the map just be z goes to r z and apply the formula for pulling back the hyperbolic metric. Oh, and there should be a two as well. Okay, so that's a pretty easy case. Another nice case is there's a region surprisingly important that I call one over the unit disk. This is the set of Z such that the absolute value of Z is bigger than one. And I include in it the point at infinity. So in other words, it's the Riemann sphere minus the closed unit disk. So let me call this region U. What's an example of a mapping F that sends the outside of the unit disk to the inside analytically? Like minus one over Z. Yeah, minus one over Z or one over Z. It's pretty simple. <laughs> so if we let F of Z 
p1 over z, then that maps the outside to the inside. And, uh, and you'll see very easily that you get a very similar formula for the hyperbolic metric. Um, let me see, I didn't write it down, but it it's, uh, has to be something roughly like 2dz over the absolute value of z squared minus 1. So now z is outside of the unit disk. It, it, this still blows up as you, um, as you go to the boundary. Okay, now once we have the outside of the unit disk, once we know something is isomorphic to the disk, we can then apply a further mapping to send it to a new region. And so since the outside is isomorphic to the disk, so is anything that's a conformal image of the outside. So here's a surprisingly important uh, mapping. I mean, I'll put it down here. It's the mapping f of z is z plus 1 over z on the outside of the unit disk. Let's think about what this mapping does. Well, on if you pick a point z that's on the unit circle, then 1 over z is the same as its complex conjugate. So on the unit circle, the value of this map is the same as z plus z bar. And z plus z bar is the same as 2 times the real part of z. And if z is at angle theta, in other words, if the argument of z is equal to theta, then the real part of z and the absolute value is 1, then of course z is sine theta plus i sine theta. And so this mapping on the circle is 2 cosine theta. So let me sum that up by saying this map, f of z plus 1 over z, has the property that f of e to the i theta is 2 cosine theta. So what does this mapping do? It takes this round circle and it maps it to a slit that runs from minus 2 to 2. It sends the point i and minus i, these are the points with argument of 90 degrees, to the cosine of 90 degrees or minus 90 degrees, which is 0. Okay, so it simply squishes this disk and makes it disappear. It sends the outside of this interval to um, the region, it sends you to the outside of this interval. And in fact, it's a one to one and onto map. You can guess that it's one to one to onto from the fact that for large z, its value is, uh, is almost just z, because one over z becomes negligible. And in fact, if you were to take a circle of some radius r, what you would find is that it's sent to an ellipse. And where do you think the foci of these ellipses are? At the endpoints. That's right. So in fact, the images of the round circles in the plane here are sent to uh, to ellipse to ellipses with foci at uh, plus or minus two. And um, and it would also be interesting to see what happens to the radial lines. Now, every radial line through the origin crosses the unit circle. Its image turns out to be a conic. Remember that conformal maps preserve angles. So they're going to be at 90 degree angles to this pencil of ellipses here. The ellipses with both side plus or minus two. What do you think those curves are? Hyperbola. Hyperbola, that's right. So these lines. Get sent to the family of hyperbolas that look like this. Okay, so we get this beautiful image uh, using very simple conic uh, conics in the plane of the behavior of this mapping z plus one over z. Okay. 
and it sort of turns uh, polar coordinates into these um, ellipse slash hyperbola coordinates on the complement of the segment from minus two to two. In any case, what this shows is that the complement of an interval from minus two to two in the Riemann sphere is isomorphic to the unit disk. So this, so as a corollary of this, we call this example four, corollary, if you take the Riemann sphere minus A, where A is any circular arc, uh, call this U, then U is isomorphic to the unit disk. Okay, and the reason is that if you have a circular arc somewhere, see it's part of this circle C, and it goes from A to B, what you can do is you can pick an additional point on the circle C, and then you apply a Mobius transformation to send this to infinity. And then we can also send these two points to any two points we like. So we send this to minus two, and we send this to plus two. And that transforms the circular arc by a Mobius transformation to this interval from minus two to two. So the complement of this circular arc is isomorphic to the complement of this straight line segment. Okay, so, so we've shown that there is a Riemann mapping that is an isomorphism between the unit disk and any round ball, the outside of any ball, and the outside of any interval, or the outside of any circular arc. So they're pretty, pretty robust. Okay, so now we haven't done too much yet. We've used Mobius transformation and use one particular quadratic rational map. Let's do something slightly more exotic using the upper half plane. So suppose we take the upper half plane and we apply to it the map Z goes to Z to the alpha where say zero is less than alpha is less than two. What is the image of the upper half plane under this map? Well, first you should get a little queasy feeling in your stomach when I write down Z to the alpha. Why? Because Z to the alpha is not really well-defined. Like the square root of Z isn't well-defined, right? There's two possible values of the square root. Fractional powers are never well-defined. But what we can do to make this well-defined is require that on the positive real axis, it looks like our old friend X goes to X to the alpha. So in, so in that case, this particular branch of the function will send the positive real axis to the positive real axis. We also know that the argument of Z to the alpha is alpha times the argument of Z. So if we look over here at the negative real axis, the argument of these points, their angle is measured in this, by the standard branch in the upper half plane, which goes from theta equals zero to theta equals pi, their argument is pi. And so when you, X, when you raise to the power alpha, what happens is this angle changes, it gets multiplied by alpha. So for example, if alpha was a half, we would be taking the square root of the upper half plane. The square root of minus one would be i. And the image of the upper half plane would be this region here. Alpha is equal to half. And what we see is that this angle of the origin, which used to be pi, is transformed to a new angle, which is pi times alpha. And that's what happens in general. So this won't go to i, but it will go to um, uh, e to the pi i times alpha, which might not be pointing straight up. And so the image is this region that I'll call h alpha, 
it's a kind of bent version of the upper half plane. Notice, of course, if I let alpha be one, then I get h one is just h itself. This angle becomes pi. So what that shows is that these pie-shaped regions, or quadrants, or narrower or wider versions of quadrants in the complex plane are also isomorphic to the unit disk. And therefore, they also have hyperbolic metrics on them and so on. Um, why did I choose alpha to be less than 2? Otherwise, it's not 1 to 1. That's right. So what happens as you increase alpha is this, this fan, it's like a fan. The fan starts to open it up. When alpha is bigger than one, the image looks like this. It's no longer convex. And the real axis, the negative real axis starts to come around and it eventually coincides with itself. So actually when alpha is equal to two, we still have a univalent map. In fact, we have a map of the upper half plane to the complement of the positive real axis. That's z squared. So notice that what we're seeing here is a map of the upper half plane to the outside of a circular arc, which happens to be a straight line in this case because it goes through the point at infinity. So the map when alpha is 2 is the same up to Mobius transformations as the map we just discussed that squishes the disk down to a slit. Uh, but if we try to allow alpha to go past 2, what happens is this part of the map comes over and points in this region, if we go all the way around past 2 pi and keep going, points in this region have two pre-images, and so the map is no longer one-to-one. -one. Okay, now as a corollary of this example, I don't remember what number this is, let me call it 5, 6, we have that any loop L is isomorphic to the unit disk. So if we take what's a loon, a loon is the region between two circular arcs, like this, called L. So in fact, you can find quite concretely a conformal map from the upper half plane to the region between any two circles. Why is that? How can I reduce six to five? Uh, the, I guess like the, when you have the, the thing bounded by these two lines, you could take a, uh, a Mobius transformation and get something bounded between like arc, circular arcs. Okay, but how about if I start with this guy, L? How do I reduce it to something that looks like this? Uh, I was thinking we try to send each of the arcs of the circle to the axes. Okay, how can we do that? How can we make sure that they go there? There's two points here, P and Q, that play an important role. Where should I send them? Like send P to the origin and Q to the infinity. Yeah, exactly. So the, the key point about simplifying circular region is that circles through infinity are a straight line. So if you apply a Mobius transformation, it moves a point on the circle to infinity, then your life is greatly simplified. So if you send Q to infinity and P to zero, then this loon will, up to a rotation, go to some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, pie slice uh, that uh, is isomorphic to HL. Okay, now I want to come to, I want to answer a very interesting, important problem. The first problem where we're going to actually study a region that's not simply connected. So if you have a region in the plane and it's not simply connected, the simplest it, its fundamental group can be is the cyclic group C. So we want something that has the homotopy type of a circle and is as simple as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the unit disk and we're just going to remove the origin. So this is the unit disk with zero removed. It's the set of Z, such that zero is less than the absolute value of Z is less than one. 
And what I'd like to ask is a question. What is the hyperbolic metric on this region? Rho delta star. In fact, what I'd really like to understand is what does this region look like in the hyperbolic metric? So here's the origin. The hyperbolic metric on any region is complete. The Euclidean metric on this region is not complete because it's a finite distance to the origin, but the origin is not in the region. So we must have some metric on this region, on the punctured disk, which turns it into a complete metric space. So let me make a guess. I want it to take an infinite amount of time to get to the origin. When we were in the upper half plane, what we did is we divided by y, which y was the distance to the boundary. Well, when you're close to the origin, the distance to the origin is just the absolute value of z. So I'm going to try, I'm going to call this uh, rho tilde, I'm going to try the absolute value of z, dz over z. Now, before I check to see if this is right, let's think about what the puncture disk looks like in this metric. So suppose I take a Euclidean circle of radius r. And I ask myself, what is its length? Well, the length of the unit circle in this metric is one because the absolute value of z is one on the unit circle. Sorry, it's two pi because we get the ordinary Euclidean metric there. What about on the circle of radius r? Well, the Euclidean length is 2 pi r, but we divide by r. So the, Euclid, so the rho tilde length of this is still equal to 2 pi. Because we divided by the absolute value of z, all of these circles have the same length. Also, if we draw a line from the boundary of the disk towards the origin, that line is infinitely long because um, when you integrate 1 over z, you get a logarithm coming out and the integral diverges. So what does the puncture disk look like in this metric? Does anybody have an idea? Like a cylinder? Yeah. In fact, what, what it looks like is a half infinite cylinder. So the puncture disk looks like this. And what happens actually is that when you look at the circle of radius r, its distance from the, from the unit circle, this distance in the row tilde metric is, is uh, the logarithm of 1 over r. So basically, since 1 over z is the derivative of the logarithm, this looks like the image of the unit disk under the logarithm now. And, and, and so geometrically, it's just an infinite right cylinder. It goes off to infinity like this. So that's a guess for what the hyperbolic metric might look like on the punctured disk. But it turns out to be wrong. <laughs> for one thing, this metric is not complete near the circle. That's very bad. Remember, the hyperbolic metric has to be complete. It's a finite distance to get to the circle in this metric. So it does, hasn't seen the boundary in a very powerful way. So it turns out the hyperbolic metric expands the area near the circle very rapidly. That's one way it differs from this metric, but it also contracts the area near the puncture quite rapidly. So in fact, the correct answer is the hyperbolic metric on the puncture disk is dz over the absolute value of z times the logarithm of the absolute value of z. And because of this logarithmic factor, it turns out that the picture looks like this. So first, log z goes to zero as you get close to the circle. So the metric flares out much more near the unit disk. But log z goes to infinity as you go to zero, so it narrows 
narrows the um, the shape of the of the region. And so the picture of Delta star in its beautiful intrinsic and formally natural hyperbolic metric is that it's what's called a cusp. It's a complete surface of negative curvature with a single point missing. It sort of goes off like a spike trying to reach zero, but you can never reach zero. It's an infinite distance away. And perhaps most interesting, the area between the circle of any given radius less than one and the cusp turns out to be finite. There's finite amount of area here. There's infinite area up here, but only a finite amount of area near the cusp. Well, I think I'll defer the calculation of this metric till next time, but let me explain how you can prove by pure thought that the amount of area near the cusp has to be finite. So let's recall, well, let's consider a map F punctured disk to itself given by F of Z is Z squared. Now, what kind of map is this? Well, if I ask you what kind of map of F of Z equals Z squared is on the circle, what kind of map of the circle to itself is that? From a topological point of view. <laughs> it's a covering map. It's a degree two covering map. And indeed, it's also a degree two covering map from the puncture disk to itself. So if you were to take a point in the domain and draw a little ball around it, see it's on the positive real axis, it would then have its preim image would consist of two balls. So if this is U, its preim image would consist of V and minus V. And each of these would map by a homeomorphism down to U. In fact, Z goes to Z squared is a covering map of the punctured plane to itself. Okay, now what, how do covering maps behave for the hyperbolic metric? They are local isometries. So this is a local isometry for the hyperbolic metric. Okay, so now what I want to do is draw it over here, is tile a neighborhood of the origin as follows. Let me take a circle of subradius R and then its image under F. So that'll be a radius R squared. And between these two circles, I have a compact annulus, A0. And I've arranged that F sends this boundary to this boundary, of course, two to one. Now, suppose I let AI be F to the I of A0. What do these annuli look like? Well, when I apply F to A0, the outer boundary goes to the inner one, and the boundary of, at radius R squared goes to a smaller circle at radius R to the fourth. And then I get a new annulus A1 here. And then erase the labeling of the origin. The image of A2 gives me another annulus that nests down even closer. Its inner radius is R to the eighth. And then, then I get A3 and so on. So I get a sequence of annuli, which if I think of them as closed annuli, they tile a neighborhood of the origin. So the union of the AI is equal to a neighborhood of zero. In other words, it's the region the zero is less than the absolute value of z is less than or equal to r. Now, how is the area of a1 related to the area of a0? Remember, these maps are local isometries for the hyperbolic metric. So they preserve area locally 
But this map from A0 to A1 is not a one-to-one -one map. It's a two-to-one covering map. So what's the area of A1 in terms of the area of A0? Twice the area. Sorry? Twice the area. Nope. Close half, the, half the area? Half the area. <laughs> yes. Every point in A1 has two preimages in A0. So A0 is twice as big as A1 since it's a two to one cover of A1. Or to put it differently, the area of A1 is one half the area of A0. And by the same token, the area of AI is two to the minus i times the area of A0. And therefore, the sum of the areas of the AIs is finite and my picture is, uh, is justified. Okay, so that's a sort of dynamical way to try, try to get into visualizing what the hyperbolic metric is on the punctured disk. Okay, so next time we'll do many more examples uh, of elementary mappings, and then we'll prove the Riemann mapping theorem, which says that uh, these conformal maps exist in great abundance. So if you've if you've heard of the Riemann mapping theorem, but don't quite remember how it goes, I'm going to urge you to review it for uh, next time. And maybe we'll go into breakout rooms and have a little discussion of the proof before we all go through it together. It's a good occasion to review many principles of complex analysis that go into the, go into the proof. Um, okay, so.